ideas that I would like to share. Um, I can see the reflection there, so I can see that the projection is, is coming, it's following me. Uh, so the first set of ideas is around education. What is education today, really? Um, so today's education scenario is bleak and bitter, and this is not really good news, uh, but anyway, bear with me, I think we'll get somewhere eventually more positive. Um, I don't know what we here, sitting in this room, think of education today. But I'm not sure how many of us would have foreseen that education would become an equivalent for business and profits. The sad, not news anymore, but the sad news is that education had been turned into a profitable business as anything that lies under the sun in neoliberal conditions. Students turn into customers and educators into service, service providers. The students start their studies under the pressure of the attained debts they encounter themselves in, and again, I'm talking about the UK, after making a decision to pursue higher education. So it's a quite big decision in the UK to go to universities because the first year is only £9,000 uh, in any uh, BA across the country. So um, educators, on the other hand, find themselves grappling with precarious working conditions, most of them in zero hours contracts, meaning like they don't know how many hours they're going to work each month, therefore they don't know how much they will get paid. So educators on the other hand find themselves grappling with precarious working conditions, being pressured by performance indicators and student satisfaction rates, when trying to fulfill the ever more demanding students who want to get value for money. It's really a business. It's kind of a service provider, a service uh, provider, so a customer service relationship between students and, and educators. So universities nowadays are businesses whose aims are to invest and make profit from a diverse portfolio. I think it resonates a bit like how businesses are run, right? We need to diversify the portfolio in, 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 in case of crisis or anything that happens to the market. So investment are in real estate and other sources of income, most likely sources that have nothing to do with education. So I think the question then is, in the midst of the financialization of the sector, what happens to the arguably core activity of these institutions, aka education? We might have already forgotten, but the whole purpose of universities and schools were actually education. 
that thing that we call education, just to tackle a bit like the notion of education of what, what we might understand by this, is a quite Western uh, that runs from the business of teaching and learning, as I just mentioned, to the, and this is my sentence, the beauty of entertaining not yet known answers for any unexpected questions. So, so the, very much the idea that education can be actually a platform for unknown knowledges. Where is that space and time? This is a question I would like to entertain today. So it's Fred Martin and Stefano Harney, the authors of The Under Common, is a book that came out, um, I think, 2015, if I'm not mistaken, to uh, US uh, theorists. Uh, and the question is available online, so it's um, open access. Uh, as they say, and one of the chapters in this book is actually looking at, at education specifically, they say that education is the moment when the unexpected beautiful phrase is uttered. So we, what is that space for that openness in that time? By following the advice of my colleague, Nofer Sternfeld, the educator and curator in Documenta Castle, who once told me, we have to stop thinking that the future is better. If we want to make it a better place, we need to start preparing for it. Not only analyzing the current conditions, we can do... Uh, so, in order to prepare for the future, not only analyzing the current conditions, but also positing alternative realities and then plot them out um, how they come, how they can come into being. So very much kind of going through the process of speculative, almost speculative thinking. So the two questions I would like to ask today, one is what I've been, I think, already addressing, is what do we mean by education in other neoliberal conditions, on one hand, but also the other one is what do we do with the resources we have available? And I think this second question is very much a way for me to then introduce campus and to explain why we are doing campus and why now. Um, so in order to help answer this question, as I told you, I'm going to take you on this journey through art schools uh, in the last... Well done. Uh, in the last hundred years, thank you. So art school, 1919 and 2019. It's interesting to notice that today, now, in 2019, we are celebrating the centenary of three major schools um, across the world. And, um, and, and so it's a moment for us also, I think, to look back, but also to look at what we want to be doing for the next 100 years or just 10 years, which is already quite ambitious. <laughs> So in the last 100 years, art schools have gone through a fast process of restructuring. Today, in 2019, we are celebrating the centenary of a few new schools that introduced new models for art education across the world. It sparks to mind the Bauhaus, which I'm assuming you uh, will be familiar with. So an art and design school founded by Walter Gropius in, uh, in Weimar in Germany, but then moved to Dessau, finally to Berlin, when it was shut down by the Nazis in 1933. Among its students and staff, there are people that we also recognize, Paul Klee, Kandinsky, Joseph N. Annie Albers, Oskar Schlemmer, um, etc., etc. In the same year, Unavi's group opened in Belarus with Mark Chagall as a director and then who handed over the directorship to Malevich. Still in 1919, in India, Tagore founded the Bharati School um, in West Bengal. The new school, um, Tagore School, is based on the Forest School, which similarly to the Bauhaus and uh, Unavi's, was meant to be a living laboratory laboratory and on experiments in an experiment in art, life and crafts. So what happens across these schools, these different models in various ways, is that there's a tendency to bring together art that was back then fine art, painting, sculpture as we know it still today, but to bring them together with crafts and technology. A year later, 2020, uh, KUTEMAS, which stands for Higher, uh, Higher State Artistic and Technical Studies, opens in Moscow. Uh, this school was formed by a merge of two 3D schools, the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture and Architecture, and the Stroganov uh, School of Applied Arts. Again, we can see here fine arts and applied arts kind of bringing it all together. 
Um, and we can identify names in, in this school, uh, such as Elisitsky, but also Rochenko and Popova. So despite their inherent differences, these three schools that I just mentioned, uh, four schools that I just mentioned, it's interesting to see the crossovers in these rather emancipatory educational programs. In Eastern and Central Europe, uh, the, school, uh, the new schools can be contextualized within the revolutionary movements taking place in the region that culminated on one hand in the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and the foundation of the Weimar Republic two years later in Germany. So Weimar Republic coincides with the launch, with the, with the launch of the Bauhaus in the same city. These movements can be characterized by its struggles against the imperial regimes and the will to strengthen the participation of the people in the political systems. It's interesting to see also that all these different projects think of mass production contrary to the original or the singular artwork. So we're really kind of opening up to ideas that we today also see being played out by, for instance, IKEA. These revolutionary spirits also brought new ideas to the educational system that necessarily, so there's a kind of corresponds or a sense of uh, influence uh, between the, 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 the political scene and what's happening in art schools. And so what are these new ideas? Despite the differences between schools, as I said before, there are some common aspects that, that, aspects that can be summarized. Since the Renaissance, if you look at the trajectory, and I'm here doing a genealogy that is very much based on the Western uh, idea of art schools, uh, so apologies for that, it's very kind of framed within this geography, but going back to, to that uh, trajectory, since the Renaissance until that moment in time, so 1919, uh, art was taught as a set of skills to be imitated by those talented enough to follow the master. The master figure wouldn't be overcome but recognized as the role model that the group of apprentices learn how to imitate. This is kind of the paradigm to summarize, the paradigm before um, 1919. This master apprentice model is fundamentally challenged in the beginning of the 20th century um, with schools like the ones I mentioned, bef oh, I mentioned before. Contrary to the Renaissance paradigm, the new schools see the role of art in a quite different case. Art is not devoted to imitation, but actually to invention and innovation, technology and mass consumption, as I just, as, uh, just mentioned. At Junadis, for instance, staff and students recognized that the tasks which lay before them were of epic, epic proportion. Unavi's members embraced communality and promoted the emergence of an artist party or collective similar to that which existed in the political sphere. So kind of the idea of communality um, that resonates with socialism. In essence, Unavi's uh, members relinquished their status as individuals, choosing to sign works with the standard seal of Unovis, the Malevich inspired black square rather than their own names or initials. According to these new models, talent is not innate, but able to be explored should be necessary requirements and equipment in place. In order to promote the students' creativity, well-furnished workshops go hand in hand with innovative tutors and the master system that was uh, characterized, it was kind of present in the Renaissance, is replaced by group workshops. So the idea is that students can be brought together um, and can work together on various activities regardless of the discipline they want to pursue. Another important innovation is the blend between disciplines explored in the interdisciplinary workshops and encouraged by the school's ethos. Examples of these is for, for instance Oscar Schlemmer's workshop, the stage uh, workshop, where he's bringing together the ideas around color, shape, movement, and uh, a lot of their, uh, a lot of his uh, theatre plays and ballet plays, if you are familiar with, they really speak to those new experiments. But also another thing that happens uh, back in the day is also the, in the, the creation of something called Foundation Year. I don't know if you are familiar with that here, but it's still present in most of the art and design programs in the UK uh, nowadays. And the idea is that students would, uh, for the first year, would uh, experiment, would have a, a student experience in each workshop, regardless of, again, their particular interests. 
So when they would continue to develop their studies, they would have knowledge across the board. Say, you know, students in the leading workshop would necessarily in the first year have experience in photography and in the stage workshop, etc. So really very much trying to foster not only collaboration, but also uh, a more, let's say, sophisticated cultural practitioner um, with knowledge across, across the board. Um, so, so now if we look at UK, and I just mentioned this overlap in the sense that, for instance, the foundation degree is still very present today in, in education in UK, but if we look at a bit closer to what happened in UK, it, um, in the 30s, it's interesting to see that some of the people that were involved in the Bauhaus, um, as you know, uh, most of them had to be Germany, and some of them went to the UK. For instance, uh, Lazlo Moholinaji was in the UK, in London specifically, for uh, a few years, but because of language barriers and uh, because of also, according to him, the British uh, scene, art scene, was not yet ready for modernism. Uh, so eventually then it goes to uh, the US and opens the new Bauhaus house in Chicago. Um, but still, just to mention that a few people do go to the UK, but back then there's very, very little resonance with the scene there. Um, it might be because of the reason that uh, Naji uh, uh, points out. Uh, it's only then in the 60s that we can see in art education in the UK some references to the Bauhaus, not anymore through their former practitioners, but actually through, for instance, Richard Hamilton, who is a, a, pop, uh, um, a UK pop artist that very much brings the idea of basic design, again, an idea that was explored by the Bauhaus uh, tutors, that brings that to the CV, the curricula in the UK. So, um, so, as I was saying, we have to wait until the 60s to, to see some sort of, of resonances there. Um, but what, where I want to get, really, uh, that speaks more to the, to the contemporary context is to the 80s and the 90s. So with the surge of the schools, of art schools across the UK, and there's a big, big, big uh, increase of art schools in the UK in the 50s. It's not necessarily to do with interest in art specifically, but has to do with uh, an, a, a relationship between the industry and art schools. So understand, uh, the, the British system understands that practitioners that will be then working for the industry, for instance, lace industry, need to get some sort of training. Okay, so art schools were meant to do that, but they also become sites of experimentation. So as I was saying, with the surge of art schools, uh, there is also an increase of the BA, MFA, PhDs that we today are very familiar with um, in the sector, and that leads to the professionalization of the artist. In the book School, Sam Thorne, um, school is the title of the book, Sam Thorne, the, the author, also the director of Not Even Contemporary, argues that by the late 80s and early 90s, the discursive mode of teaching had become a more professionalized form of sociability, one with close ties to the commercial art world. So what we see uh, happening in the 80s and 90s, which actually overlaps with, uh, 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 I don't know if you're familiar with Margaret Thatcher, who, who is a prime minister in the UK in the late 70s and the early um, 80s, um, so overlaps very much with, with her period in power. Uh, so what we see happening in the art system is also that artists start to, start to be training to, um, to have a closer relationship with the markets. So they are not meant to sit in the backdrop anymore, they are meant also to introduce their work, to go for dinner with collectors, with art museum, and art museum directors, etc. So, so what Sam Thorne is out there is doing is to bring, in, to bring these two elements together, socialization and professionalization of the artist, along with sociability that has close ties with the commercial art world. So art historian Lane Malia remarks, hanging out, and I quote, hanging out, talking shop, and making connections with faculty and visiting artists has replaced the system of codifications of pedagogy, of syllabi, of syllabi and seminars, where hanging out has likewise become a paradigm for artwork. And for those of you here familiar with relational aesthetics that Nicola Bofield coined at the beginning of this century, this is very much like the outcomes of that. 
art is something to be to socialize. So then an opening is a moment to create their own artworks that might be coming to being through a meal. For instance, uh, the Amnesia would be a good example of that. This process overlaps with the development of the art market, where the figure of the artist is more and more part of. The artist is expected to be able to engage with the social side of the art market beyond the studio, able to hang out with collectors and museum directors, curators and art critics. The development of the ties with the increasing focus on the social dimension of the role of the artist happens in the last years of Thatcherism, as I was mentioning before, in UK. I mean, Margaret Thatcher, for those of you who are not familiar, is known for things like attacking social housing, uh, being against unions, uh, and privatizing uh, very much everything that was public um, in the UK. Um, as Sam Thorne remarks in the same book, quote, entrepreneurialism and art schools had become overlapping rounds, so these two things are very much uh, intertwined. But the paradigm was yet to become even more neoliberal. The educational system in the UK moves from professionalization to corporate corporatization and student debt. In 2011, the implementation of heavy tuition fees in public education changes the paradigm of not only art education, but ed education at large. I mean, if you think of what changes, if you have to uh, get a loan of um, you know, three times 9,000 pounds in order to study in higher education, imagine how that changes the relationship you have with the very idea of education, with your tutors, with the institution, etc. Let alone the pressure that is on the other side say, tutors and curricula to perform something that is worth the money uh, because students will keep you, you know, um, under their eye in the sense that they want to make sure that what they are paying for is being, uh, um, uh, is, is, is being received. So this process overlaps with the develop, uh, sorry, um, okay, currently in Britain, Fees for domestic students are in the region of 9,000 per year for BA degrees. Students opt for higher education to learn spe specialized skills to increase their employability in the job market, not necessarily to learn something new. Uh, and by the end of their three-year studies, expect to be equipped with the necessary tools to be employable. So this idea of employability is a big thing in the UK. So most of the institutions today, especially those that are there's two kind of universities in the UK, one that are research lab and the others that are not. They are former polytechnics, so they are more, uh, say, practical uh, um, or more practice-based institutions. So what they uh, uh, bet on, really, is to convince parents that after students finish their degrees, they will be employable. And the way they, they cover that is to offer students a placement. A placement is a kind of a student experience, professional experience, throughout their degrees. So when they finish their degree, they are eventually more competitive. Um, so students opt for higher education to learn specialized uh, uh, skills, as I was saying, but upon conclusion, so when they, when they finish their degrees, they are welcomed with their study skill. Uh, and their, their first job will help pay um, the, uh, their loan, their debt in this case. In line with the corporatization of education and the market-oriented orientated philosophy, students see themselves as customers and tutors are as service providers. One looks for the best value for money in the market, which is influenced by a combination of reputational capital and studies studies quality. So it's very important to see how good your university is doing out there, for instance. Uh, and if you are based in London, you are most likely more competitive just because you are based in London, for instance. In the process of the neoliberalization of education, universities have also changed their focus. They are not uh, anymore uh, more institutions of education where teaching and learning are the core of their activities. They are now encouraged to diversify their portfolios, um, develop their develop new business models, attract funding, and invest in real estate. It's really big companies, I mean, and, and if you visit the UK, especially the city-based institutions, universities, you'll see that most of the property around the university campus is all owned by the university. It is not used for educational purposes, and this is proper uh, investment. 
So the question here is, uh, what happens to the actual practice or process of education? What happens to the, as I said before, the beauty of entertaining not yet uh, known answers uh, for unexpected questions, of creating spaces for emancipatory learning in safe environments, of collectively formulating alternative realities and plotting out how they come into being? The short answer to these is, there's no time, there's no interest, and it's not profitable enough. So it's really a, a big question uh, in UK. I don't know how the situation is in here, but it would be great to, uh, to know more. So just for the time being, and for the, whatever time is left uh, for my presentation, I wanted to propose a kind of an exercise um, where I would like you, I mean, I haven't said everything I've said so far, but uh, just like really practice our imagination and think for five minutes that education is not, okay, not the repeating and confirmation of inherited knowledges, the masterful production of expertise, the authoritarian pronouncement of truth, and the training of people for a specific discipline. So it's not this, okay? So if it's not this, what might education be. My proposal for the time being, and I'm open to your suggestions afterwards, uh, for the time being is that education stands for, or becomes a shorthand for a forum, for debate and critical thinking, for the co-production of questions and dignity, and dignity is really important, and inquiry, often determined by, a simple, by simple contingencies of where people happen to begin a conversation. So just that is an entry point eventually for what we might call education. It's also perceptual, is a low-key transformative process, involves duration, so we need time to do this, and also the working out of contested common ground. Right, so if we understand education as that, and not as everything I mentioned before, let's see what happens. Because in the context of shrinking spaces and possibilities in time, uh, education might have some potentialities. Might have. So I think we need to entertain that for a bit. And as Rax Media Collective, it's a group of three artists based in New Delhi, in India, as they said when talking about education, and I quote, the point of education is not to render all things and ourselves transparent and magical but to insist on the interpretative worth of margins of error, of accidents and serendipity, of uncanny resonances and speculative layering, of doubt and ambiguity as the foundation of an epistemology that does not have to ground itself in the dead habits of certainty. And I think this epistemology that they mentioned here might be the work we need to do. I think it's not gonna be given is not going to be provided for us. Right, so now we enter the third block, and it's the last one, but this is where I want to start explaining why campus and the independence of the program, we are going to start in ethnonic contemporary in October, so now in two weeks time, so otherwise kind of getting ready for this to happen. Um, so I want to tell you why we're doing it and why it's urgent for us to do it. Um, so, so as I said, the situation is not very uh, inspiring, to say the least, and so there are a few things that we have to bear in mind now. Uh, one is the lack of critical thinking, so we don't have time for that, because you just need to train people as fast as you can and people want to, do, they know what they want, they come to you and they say, I want to learn Photoshop, that's what I think I need, it's not like these conversations, it's not going to, going to get me anywhere, and it's not their fault, it's just because they were told, in fact, I'm not saying, I'm not blaming the students, uh, actually the opposite. Um, so the lack of critical thinking is one important aspect, but also the impact that these kind of policies have in the field at large, I mean, we are cultural practitioners, I don't know what you do in life, but if you work in cultural institutions, and if you know that you don't have space and time for critical thinking, there's something fundamentally wrong. 
So it's not just education on, on one side and us practicing on the other that necessarily speaks to us. Our audience, our colleagues in the future are going to be those people as well. So what do we do as well for us and to make sure that this, uh, um, this space of critical thinking exists? And the other thing is, what do we do with our infrastructure? I mean, Nottingham Contemporary is, is not a big institution, but it's big enough. We have four galleries, 800 square meters in a small uh, project space. We have a performance space, also of 300 square meters. And we have meeting rooms. So there's a lot of space. What do we do with that? And I think this is really the question. Is how do you, do you render your institution available um, for something that you find uh, you and you and expanded field find urgent today? So in order to uh, to, to think, um, in order to to address this, uh, how many of you here work in the cultural sector? Just for me to right. So I think I think you know uh, what it is to be constantly pushed and, and by the urge to deliver. We have to do more. We have to continue uh, performing. Uh, we don't have time to reflect on what we're doing. Um, and on top of all that, we need to deal with very fashionable topics that <laughs> you know attract to more audiences or not. But this is kind of the, the, the belief, I guess, that exists in the cultural sector. So we need to keep performing. We don't have necessarily time to reflect upon what we are doing. So one of the things we were doing at Money Contemporary, and this is something I've been kind of developing for the last three years, is to think how the cultural sector is also a site of knowledge production. So first to say that that's not exclusive to the HE, to the higher education sector, and then to say, well, then to say, I believe that we also produce knowledge through our practices, but also through the ways in which we juxtapose objects in the exhibition space, but also the way we articulate our public programs, for instance. So how do we, how can we talk about that, articulate that properly when we come to conversations about knowledge production, for instance, with our colleagues elsewhere? So this is something I've been trying to do and also thinking about the time it requires as well for us to take that knowledge production seriously. So one of the things uh, I initiated three years ago, as I was saying, is instead of responding only to the exhibitions we have as a contemporary, and we have new exhibitions every three months, and each exhibition brings a completely different new set of ideas, very interesting all of them, but you know, I, th I thought, well, we might want to respond with some activities to those new exhibitions, but we might also want to identify the questions we want to entertain for a longer period of time. So I initiated something that is research trends, and all it is is to identify, we currently have three research trends that are active, and all it is is to identify a research question that we, and when I say we, is my team, but also the expanded field of the team, because we work with a lot of collaborators in universities, in the cultural sector, and also local groups, to identify questions that we find urgent. And we don't want to articulate them in one event only. We want to take some time. So usually they take place for two years, at least. What I've done now is to launch a research strand on critical pedagogies. And this starts speaking to the idea around education. There's a few things that we, uh, we are developing around critical pedagogies. There's, for instance, a, a conference that's kind of very sort of traditional format, a conference we are doing on architectures of education, that's sort of in collaboration with Leaflux Architecture, I don't know if you're familiar uh, with, in, in November now, in a month time, uh, also a series of workshops several events, but also on our journal, we have a, an online journal, the Contemporary Journal, uh, that each year is looking at a particular uh, topic, and now, uh, as we speak, is critical pedagogy is the topic uh, that we are entertaining there. So take a look, and you'll see a very interesting article by Andrea Phillips, precisely providing a potential context. It's a very critical uh, um, reading on campus, but providing a, a potential context for, for campus. Um, so as I was saying, this critical pedagogies research trend is a way for us to provide different entry points to the same set of questions. And another element that comes with it is campus. 
So Campus is uh, a year-long uh, independent study program, uh, city-wide as well. We are um, we are um, um, developing and, and uh, holding our seminars in various uh, cultural institutions in across the city and in collaboration with our colleagues. Uh, and the study program is on curatorial uh, visual cultures and cultural studies. Um, it well, it's important to say that we run an open call uh, in, in uh, January, last, uh, no, January 2019. Uh, we selected 20 participants uh, that are going to start now, as I said, in October. Um, and, um, and the idea was that this, this program would uh, speak to people coming from different disciplines and walks of lives. And when I say disciplines, I also uh, I don't say only uh, sociology, philosophy, arts, curatorial studies. I also mean people that come with different sets of, of questions and preoccupations. Um, and so, uh, okay, so this is kind of in a, a nutshell what what campus is. Um, what, what we thought was important and the reason why it's a year-long program is because again we need time and we need to think of an open-ended process which hopefully campus will generate. We will meet every month for three days in a row and for each seminar we will have a different guest speaker uh, joining us in order to bring different sets of ideas that are not only provided by uh, the group members. Um, also, as I said before, it was important for us to, to ask the question, what do we do with the space that we have available and how we render this space available for other kinds of uh, activities. And I think this is, this is one of the, you know, it's a humble answer, but it's something that we thought would be important to, to do uh, in terms of like the pressure on football that exists in UK for um, the funding in the cultural sector, um, 20 people only that throughout a year is not like extremely appealing but um, needs to be argued at least that is due to something important. Um, and finally also to think about curatorial studies or what we think of a, a curator is in, in 10 years time. This is a question we're asking ourselves as well. Um, not necessarily thinking of, of the curatorial as uh, um, an exhibition making practice or even a space for people to become better, better curators, but thinking of the curatorial as more a methodology, a, a research methodology that then will identify its output, its cultural uh, product according to the, the questions and the process that is going to, uh, to develop. I'm about to, uh, to conclude. Um, so if you want to know more uh, details about campus, how it's run and, and you know, how it's taking place, uh, I'm more than happy to answer to those questions. Uh, in order just to bring my presentation to uh, a closure, I'll just read uh, my conclusion um, quickly. So, so campus is tentatively um, about the possibility of opening up for a collective activity of study and research in public. Campus is not a curriculum or a syllabus or a set of institutional protocols. It is a possibility to make a set of concerns manifest and substantiate them in different bodies of knowledge to find a collective discourse around them. Considering the debate around alternative education, and I think you might have noticed that I haven't mentioned the term alternative so far, I wanted to make clear that campus is not alternative. Despite the tendency to call alternative to educational practices happening in the crossovers between artistic and educational practices in the art field, I'm determined to keep the alternative away from what we do at Learning Contemporary. Not only because it would make no sense to claim an alterity to a project that is by nature embedded in an institutional structure, but also because it would be naive of one to call for an outside position when there is no outside to all encompassing tentacles of neoliberalism. To claim the alternative requires resources and time to build up a fortress in opposition to whatever is opposed to. I don't think we have that time really. I believe that we need to be in solidarity today instead of opposition. 
um, more than spending time in building and uh, useless for fortresses. I'm more than happy to discuss this with you. Uh, even more true when the word alternative is being used by far-right movements such as the alt-right today. So campus, unlike these projects, wants to claim embeddedness and solidarity. Solidarity acknowledges that it is not us against them. We recognize the struggles that our colleagues are going through also in formal education. As I mentioned before, colleagues that are in zero hour contracts uh, struggling as much as we are in thinking and trying to invent and imagine new educational systems. So I think this is also in solidarity with them. And I think that the conversation that will happen in campus um, is in no moment tempting to be a silo away from the real discussions. Conversely, we wanted to invite our colleagues to be part of this conversation and be able to share whatever emerges from our collective thinking and research. Thank you so much for your time.